The last two weeks I talked about the unity between the sacred space of Mount Herzl, the Mount of the Memory in Jerusalem, and last week I talked about unity in the, and not just in Israel, but I think in the Jewish world, in the two days, in the sacred time of the three holidays of Yom HaZikaron L'Shoah, Yom HaZikaron L'Chaylei Tzahal, and then Independence Day, Yom Atzmut. Today we're going to talk about what divides us. Hey, what unifies us last week, it's already been a week, let's do it, um, and we're going to talk this week about Israeli politics. I'm going to endeavor in one hour, and it's not going to be easy, to try to go through what is the difference or what is Israeli political system all about. And I'm fully aware of the fact that it's eight o'clock my time here. I The news is on at eight primetime news, and I could go down at 9.15 when I finish my session and find out that things have totally changed and that there's been a um, there's been a vote of non-confidence. There were two actually yesterday, which did not pass, which meant that we'd go to elections. But we're not there yet. So in order to understand when that happens, there's a picture of our Knesset. I've entitled the session, How a People Without Power, that's us, became a powerful people. And how do we use that power, both in terms of, I mean, I'm not going to talk today about security and defense and weapons and that kind of stuff, but how do we use that power politically? And that's what the next hour is all about. I'll preface it by saying that one of the most popular questions I get, the most frequent questions I get from tourists is, why is the Israeli system of governance so crazy? It seems like your government barely serves its fragile culture. You're always on the brink of heading to new elections. Why does everything like feel like or seem like such a balagan over there? Well, that's a fair question, um, because almost every time, every time I pick a group up from the airport, I say, you're coming to Israel during very interesting times, true. And we could be in the midst of an election campaign, or we could be on the verge of having the Knesset uh, dissolve itself or dissolve by a vote of non-confidence and then going to new elections. Unlike your system where it's so predictable, right? We have elections every fourth year and you know federal elections and you know that um, it's going to happen on the first Tuesday after Monday in November. You can tell me from now until kingdom time when it's going to happen. And it's a pretty straightforward system. You go to vote and whoever gets the most votes wins. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, sorry. That's not quite the way it works. Oh, you've got this Oh, America. That's right. The What's it called? The college, electoral college? Oh, yeah. But it's not quite the majority. I see. So it's not pure. Oh, and then what happens? Oh, and then you have a bicameral assembly, right? You've got two houses of Congress. You've got a house of uh, representatives, and then you've got the Senate. Oh, and it's very clear who does what. Oh, I see. I get it. Okay. And there it's, it's, it's straightforward. So if you have the president from one party and one house of Congress from that president's party and the other house of Congress, oh, it's really straightforward. Oh, wait a minute. Could it ever be a situation where Congress doesn't pass legislation that the president wants or vice? Oh, I, I'm kicking you a little bit to give you a sense that your system is unique and complicated. And the prism through which you look at every other political system is your presidential system. So it's different. And the short answer I give people, this next hour is going to be the long answer, is that it is different. And you have to take off your American or your British or your Canadian, I'm originally Canadian glasses, in order to understand the difference in our system. Um, back to last week or two weeks ago, I talked about the difference between Ribonut and Rabbanut, right? The Jewish story, we did this last week, so I don't read everything here, but the thousands of years of history from the destruction of the temple when rabbinic Judaism replaced temple-based Judaism, the rabbis led us for the past 2,000 years, and Zionism begins in the late 19th century as a response to exile, but as a, uh, as a movement that puts the Jewish people as sovereign, right? Last week we talked about Ribonut, which is sovereignty of the people, versus Rabbanut, the leadership of the rabbis. Here's the Knesset, the last time I was there, December 2019, with a group of legislators, state legislators from Massachusetts, and they think they knew it all until they came to the Knesset and they said, what's going on there? But hey, did you know that the people of the state, uh, the state legislature in Massachusetts only sits for like a 40 day session, that's it, the entire year, and then they do whatever else that they do, and then they come back for a month and a half. It's different than our system, very, very, very different. And there's me in front of those legislators from uh, Massachusetts. By the way, they always have one Republican from Massachusetts. Um, but, but true, if I were a, an Israeli who didn't know that much out of America, I'd look at this group and I'd say, ooh, 20 elected officials from Massachusetts. They're probably about half Democrats and half Republicans. But knowing this group and knowing uh, Massachusetts, it's very clear that they're 99% or 95%, whatever it is, Democrats, and about 5 or 10% Republicans, because that's just the way it falls, even though um, as blue a state as Massachusetts is, they oftentimes have a red 
um, uh, governor. Think of Mitt Romney, for example, right, who was in charge of the state, yet he was a Republican, moderate, albeit, but he was Republican. Anyway, what happens after 2,000 years of rabbinic leadership, interpreting God's word? This, Israeli independence declared Ben-Gurion on the 14th of May, 1948. Um, you might remember, I don't think any of you are old enough to remember the newspaper that came out on that date, May 14th. Remember last week, we commemorate not May 14th, which is next week, but we commemorate the 5th of ER, which is the Hebrew calendar date. And there, this famous picture of the young girl outside of this secret declaration of independence. In fact, since many of you were not there, I decided I'll play a short little video of David Ben-Gurion reading part of, see if I can figure this one out here again, part of the Declaration of Independence. Um, let me try it over here and I'll get Dana Gordon. There she is. Uh, I just, uh, Dana's here. So we all the things we've talked about politics, I don't want to talk to Dana. I know she's very politically involved, so I'm not going to get much anything about politics. But did I say politics? Anyway, here is Ben-Gurion declaring independence. Ben-Gurion. <laughs> להיות כוחות עם ועם עומד ברשות עצמו במדינתו הריבונית אשר תפתח לרווחה את שערי המולדת לכל יהודי ותעניק לעם היהודי מעמד של אומה שוות זכויות בתוך העמים לפיכך נתכנסנו אנו חברי מועצת העם נציגי היישוב העברי והתנועה הציונית ביום סיום המנדט הבריטי על ארץ ישראל. ותוקף זכותנו הטבעית וההיסטורית ועל יסוד החלטת עשרת האומות המוחדות אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל, היא מדינת ישראל, תוך ביטחון בקצור ישראל. הננו חותמים בחתימת ידינו לעדות על הכרזה זו. So when the declaration was, uh, was signed, interesting enough, it, there was no mention, sorry, keep doing this, there was no mention of God at all in the declaration. There we go. And there was a debate. As some of the people, Ben Gurion was socialist, but there were others who were Marxist further to his left, who didn't think there should be any God mentioned whatsoever. Here you see Ben Gurion and Moshe Sharet, later uh, Shertok, later Sharet, the first foreign minister and the second prime minister signing the declaration. There is Golda between Ben Gurion and Sharet, and there is the document. Interestingly enough, it written written on uh, it's ty- it was typed. They formulated on the 12th of May, on Wednesday night, and they had to read it on Friday afternoon. They typed it on a, a paper, the secretary, and then they signed, a few of them who were there signed the bottom of the uh, of the parchment, and then the scribe had to write it on two or three different pieces later on. So they actually didn't sign the declaration, don't tell anybody. Anyway, when they signed it, the debate, or when they were putting the declaration together, one of the big debates was, do you mention God? And toward the end, you heard Ben-Gurion say, a reliance or security on the Tzur Israel, which in, in, in Hebrew liturgy, liturgy is the rock of Israel, the foundation of Israel. But it's also God. Um, so there was no explicit mention of God because we the people, like the American Declaration, the American um, uh, Constitution, we the people in 1776, we the people in 1948, we the people in 1789, liberty, egalitarian fraternity, the modern era, People are sovereign rather than God being sovereign. Now, how do you get to the Knesset, right? 1897, Theodore Herzl, there he is, founds the first Zionist Congress. How do we get from there to the Knesset as we see it today? Well, it's a few steps of about 50 years. In the first Zionist Congress, the World Zionist Organization, WZO, was formed, which was comprised of a number of ideological parties from the far left to the far right, and less far right, but a little bit far left, um, to religious parties in the center, and it became the governing uh, authority. Although the British were responsible, the Turks were responsible until 1917, and then the British after that, but they governed Jewish life in Palestine, the Jewish community as it was called, the Yishuv. They then formed, just in the mid-1940s, a provisional state council of 13 members from seven political parties, Right, Jews, we can never have one or two opinions. We've got seven parties. And then the government, which was this provisional state council that ultimately 10 of them voted on the 12th of May 
to declare independence and to reject an American suggestion to go to a ceasefire. They became a provisional government. The moment they declared independence, there was a war. All the Arab countries surrounding Israel attacked the Palestinian Arabs within the country attacked as well. And the first elections were only held in January of 1949. Um, the Mapai Party, David Ben Goyens, the Workers Party, the Land of Israel, got 35% of the votes. I mean, our founding father barely got a third of the votes in the election and a total of 46 of the 120 seats. He, in the end, formed a coalition government, you'll see in a couple slides. But you didn't vote even from the beginning for a, a person who voted for a party, and Ben Goyens' party, as, as, as important as a guy he was in founding the state, barely got a third of the votes. The problem. One of the big challenges of Israeli democracy, which I think we still feel, is how do you try, I mean, think of America. America is a country that was born as a democracy, right? From the beginning, what did it say? I want to go backwards here. From the beginning, it was very clear in America that you could have, that everybody voted, right? Oh, no, wait a minute. Women didn't vote, people of color didn't vote, people, were, oh, sorry, white Protestant landowners in America could vote. That was the beginning. Now it changed over time, right? I mean, now everybody can vote over the age of what is it, 18, 19, 18 in America, but it took a long time to get to that situation. I remind you ladies, you couldn't vote barely 100 years ago. I think 1919 was the first time women could vote in America. Um, people of color couldn't vote until many of our lifetimes in America as well. How do you create a democracy in Israel when you've got people coming from 70 different countries um, many of whom are from non-democratic traditions, right? We had 650,000 people in 48. Within three years, it doubled. Within our 10th birth, by our 10th birthday, it trebled. Coming from Christian Europe and Islamic Middle East, where Jews were often, for most of the history, denied rights, weren't allowed to vote, were second-class citizens. And almost all the immigrants, think of the Pale of Settlement, right? Eastern Europe came from non-democratic countries. Every Jew who immigrated from the Middle East came from a non-democratic country. How do you create a democracy? If we define ourselves as a Jewish Democrat, that's challenge one. Challenge two, if Israel defines itself as a Jewish and democratic state, how do we relate to the 20% who are not Jewish? Arabs, Muslim Christians, Muslims, uh, Christians and Druze and a small group called Cherkessens. Which of the core values is more important? Is Israel being democratic more important than Israel being Jewish or vice versa? And in 2018, Israel passed a law, controversial, called the nation state law, which sees Israel as the Jewish state as the nation state of the Jewish people, period, and nobody else. And that caused a little bit of controversy within Israeli society for the first time very clearly saying, if we see ourselves as Jewish and democratic, well, Jewish um, is a priority over democratic. Although not everybody in Israel necessarily agrees with that, that was the law passed by the Knesset. Um, look at Israeli democracy in numbers, again, very different from you guys. We have one parliament. Um, we have 120 members of that parliament. We have uh, 13, so far, 13 prime ministers. Uh, we have had 24 elections. So you do the math in 74 years. That's about one in every three years, which isn't that bad. If you were to get rid of the four elections we had in two years, it means we'd had 20 elections up until 20, up until March of 2020, which means in 52, whatever that is, in 72 years, we had only 20 elections, which was 3.6. Now it's down to th every three years because we've had this mess of four elections in the past few years. 36 different governments. Why? Um, things change in the coalition, right? You always have to have a coalition of, made up of multiple parties, and sometimes one party leaves, is fired, whatever, and so you change the, the makeup of that government. Um, and it's very different, of course, how the government ministers are, are uh, created, very different than your system, which you'll see a little bit later. First elections, there is still a war being fought. We declared independence in May of 48. By January of 49, we have elections. We haven't yet signed armistices, armistice, whatever the word is, armistices, I think, with the countries around us, and people go to vote. 86.9% turnout, which is pretty incredible. Um, there is Ben Gurion speaking ahead of the Israel Labor Party. There is a group um, from the Arab, the Palestine Labor League of the Arab Party, which is kind of connected to the Labor Party. And ultimately, Ben Gurion's Mapai Party gets 46 seats, right? Up 35% of the popular voters we saw, he formed a coalition. You need at least 61 to govern in a 120 seat, one, one seat uh, unicameral uh, uh, parliament. And so he had to get somewhere over 61. Who did he bring into his coalition? A religious party, call it the National Religious Party, which would be kind of Naftali Bennett's party today, but it's changed quite a bit. 16 seats, quite a few. 
progressive party, so to the left maybe of Ben Gurion, uh, Sephardic and Oriental communities, uh, Mizrahi party, and the Democratic List of Nazareth, a small Arab party, kind of connected to the Labour Party, or that was the Mapai, Ben Gurion's Israel Workers Party. Eventually, I say Labour because it's a term we use today, and that grew out of Ben Gurion's Mapai Party. Right? There's been a lot of movement in the names of the of the parties. For example, there was no Likud party back then. The Likud is something created in the 1970s, but Begin of the Likud um, was the leader of this party that eventually formed 40 years ago into something else. So Ben Gurion had a coalition. He got 35% of the popular vote. Where did Knesset first sit? Actually in Tel Aviv, even though Jerusalem was the capital. Here at this theater, um, not too far from the Mediterranean, it sat there and then it moved in 1951, I want to say, up to Jerusalem to a place called the Fruman House, which is um, at the corner of King George and kind of the top of Hillel Street, Ben Yehuda, downtown Jerusalem. It's still there. This is where Chaim Weitzman is sworn in as our president. I'll talk about our president in a few minutes' time as well. And we might have a unicameral uh, uh, parliament, but we have a, we have two. We have a president and a prime minister. We're not the only country, by the way, as that a lot of European countries do. Think of France. There is the building. Today it's being turned into a museum of the history of the Knesset, and there you can see um, the 1950s period cars taking the elected officials into the parliament. So once we get a little bit of background of the challenges that Israeli democracy uh, faces, I will encourage you to take your glasses off. I'm not going to take mine off because if I do, I can't see my screen. I'm sorry, but put on a new set of lenses in order to understand how our system is different than yours. I've delineated just a few, I think of almost a dozen differences between our systems. One is parliamentary versus presidential, right? The main source of governance here is the Knesset, the parliament. Your main source of governance is, oh, you've got Congress, but is the president. We don't have that. One, we have only one national among votes. We're one of only five countries where you vote not for a candidate, but for a national party list. So you can be living in the north and the south and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. It doesn't matter. There's no representative of your constituency in our Knesset. Good, bad, different. Three, it is not a winner-take-all system, like in America, right? Whoever gets the most votes wins. Oh, except when it comes to the Electoral College. But if the Electoral College, and I don't know if you can have it on the map, but if you can win by a very, very small margin, you get everything. In Israel, Ben Gurion in 1949 won 35% of the popular vote. He had 46 out of 120 seats in the parliament. He wasn't the winner taking everything. He had to struggle to form a critical mass of at least 61 of a simple majority in the 120 seat parliament in order to create a government. We don't have that winner take all system here. There is no constitution. By the way, uh, England doesn't have a constitution. Canada just had a constitution, I think, in the 1980s. We never had one for a long time. Instead, we have what is called, uh, we have what are called 14 basic laws, which are constitutional in nature, but not a proper constitution. And the idea originally was that the Declaration of Independence would be kind of this introduction to a constitution, and these laws would then be added like you have different, uh, you know, different amendments, as it were, to your constitution, they too would be added, but not there yet. We have no fixed election date, but unlike you guys, it is an official holiday. Schools are closed, and many of the schools are polling stations, of course. Um, largely state-funded. There's very limited donations to campaigns. You don't have PACs and super PACs and Uber super PACs and whatever else, and billions or trillions of dollars spent on election campaigns. It's mostly from taxpayers. If you want to give to a, a, candidate, a, a candidate running in a primary, let's say, in his or her party, right, the primaries determine the list that are then presented to the to the Knesset, um, you might be able to give a few hundred dollars. That's about it. Not not huge sums of money. There is no absentee, no early or no mail-in ballot. You must be in your polling station on that day, unless you're a soldier. My kids all voted in uniform. Multiple, my youngest one voted four times in four years in, in the army um, on his base or in training. They bring a, a polling station out to the field, literally, if you're in the hospital and if you're in prison. Even the murderer of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is eligible to vote. I guarantee you he didn't vote for the party's left of center, but he is eligible to vote, and he does uh, in the Knesset. Very high voter turnout from 86.9% in 49 continues to the state. We've always had a coalition government. We've never in our 24 elections had one party that received more than 50% of the vote. We have a prime minister who is the head of government and the president head of state. President is elected by the Knesset every seven years for a seven-year term and a secret ballot by the 120 members of Knesset. 
and it's kind of like the Queen of England, but he's a lot younger um, and he's a lot more spry. Um, his father was the president of, of uh, Israel as well. I love the Shalom Chaim Herzog, but Buji Isaac Herzog has a seven year term and he's kind of above the political milieu and he sees himself and the state sees him as a representative of a much more inclusive figure than a politician, even though he was uh, the leader of the Labour Party and had aspirations to be a prime minister, but not anymore. And we have a head of the prime minister is the head of government. I'll talk about how the government is formed a little bit later. And finally, um, the question, which I'm not going to answer, but I'll leave you with at the end, is, is our multi-party system, where we can have over 30 parties running an election and over 12 represented in our parliament, is it a more authentic representation of democracy? I believe it is. Go back to point number three. It's a winner-take-all system. If there are a million people who vote, and 501,000 vote for candidate X and 499,000 vote for candidate Y, candidate Y has no voice. In Israel, if that's the situation, then they almost have an equal voice. And it could be that candidate Y, who got two less votes than candidate X, might even be in a position of power. So that's something that's important to remember. Again, not better, not worse, different. I do, however, think, and you'll see this at the end, that now in particular, Israel is actually more representative. There are more voices that are represented sitting around a cabinet table. Here's the first cabinet in 19, uh, 1949. There's Golda Meir, the one woman in the cabinet. You see Moshe Sharet over there, of course, Ben Gurion. And here, the last time I was in the Knesset um, meeting, actually the member of, uh, when was this? In July, I think, of 2019. There it is. Meeting Yuli Edelstein, this group from San Francisco. He was the speaker of the Knesset. Um, and it strikes me because Yuli Edelstein was a prisoner of Zion. He was someone who left, who wanted to leave the Soviet Union, wasn't allowed to because he wanted to move to Israel. He finally got here and eventually is elected to become not only a member of Knesset, a minister in government, but actually the speaker of the Knesset. So, first of all, our prime minister, our parliament versus the presidential system. Four, our, uh, the uh, basic law of the Knesset, I should say says the Knesset is to be elected in general, national, direct, equal, secret, and proportional election. So everybody votes for a party. Whatever percent of that popular vote the party gets, they're represented in the parliament. In a presidential system, either voters or an electoral college, in your case, directly elect a president who then appoints his, so far his, I would say her, but not yet, cabinet secretaries who serve at his pleasure. And not your current president, but the former president had this proclivity to every Tuesday and Friday get rid of one of his cabinet members. Why? Because he or she wasn't doing what he wanted them to do. And you can do that. In Israel, you can't quite do that. Because if you do that, you might lose the entire party that that, part, that, that um, minister is, is in charge of or is a member of, and therefore you might fall below the threshold of minimum 61. You might have a minority and you might have to go to Knesset and you might lose your seat. You don't do that so quickly here. Our system, as a separation of powers. Sorry, your system is a separation of powers. Executive and legislative branches are independent. In our system, voters elect parties, which then form the parliament. A government is formed either by the largest party or a coalition of parties, which form a legislative majority. Again, at least 61 seats. The prime minister and his or her cabinet members, we have had a female prime minister, generally members of parliament, but they don't have to be members of parliament. Okay, that's important too. Are responsible to the Knesset. There must be cooperation with the executive and legislature for the government to survive. So in America, as I said, president is unhappy with secretary of defense. Goodbye. I'm going to find somebody else to do what I want to do because you serve at my pleasure. In Israel, the defense minister is chosen by the guy who, let's say Netanyahu, who had 30 seats in the Knesset. And he's the largest party, but he needs another 31 seats to form a coalition. So he picks somebody else, let's say Naftali Bennett from a party that isn't. I'm talking not now, but previous governments. And Bennett is the defense minister. But at one point, Bennett does something or even contradicts something the prime minister says. If the prime minister fires Bennett, he's losing Bennett's five or six seats, which means he might fall below the threshold, which means he loses his control of power. It's a very, 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 very different system. And the role of parliament versus president is something to keep in mind. Uh, Canada, uh, England, more countries are are uh, are, are uh, parliamentary than presidential. You've got countries where you've got both, like in France, where the president, prime minister have power. I'm not an expert on France, but they do have they do have different levels of power, and there's a separation. In Israel, the president has almost no power. As I said, he or she is a figurehead. One national district. Um, we're only five countries in the world that have that. As I mentioned, 
um, which parties are not allowed to run. So you can have a rhinoceros party, you can have a clown party, you can have a party of uh, to legalize marijuana. In fact, a few elections ago, there were two parties. The old party to legalize marijuana and the new party to legalize marijuana that was also fighting for the rights of indigent Holocaust survivors. I kid you not. So if you want to legalize marijuana, you'd have to figure out, I don't know what you'd have to do beforehand, but you have to figure out which of those two parties you would have supported. Parties cannot run if the following. One, they negate the existence of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Two, they incite to racism. Mayor Kahana of Kach, the American-born rabbi, um, he was his party was outlawed. Heirs to his party are actually sitting in the Knesset now, much to the chagrin of many like yours truly. Um, support for arm, armed host, struggle by a hostile state or a terror organization against the state of Israel. All of these are beyond the pale. And every once in a while, particularly from the Arab parties and the far left, people from the far right question whether or not one of the Arab parties um, supports armed struggle against Israel and therefore should not be allowed in the Knesset. Um, look at, and this is from the elections, I want to say in, what Knesset was this? The 19th. I can see different on my iPad, right? So from election 1 to 19, we've had 24 now. It's a complicated graph, but look at the colors. The white are the number of lists that ran, 32, 33, 30, 31, huge number of parties that run. How many are elected? Usually about a dozen or so, that's the purple, are elected to the Knesset. Now we had, I think, 30 parties in our last election, and 13 are represented in the Knesset, right? Why? Because you have to have at least three and a quarter percent of the popular vote. What happens? This is my note. Please don't take a copy of this because uh, you'll vote. Actually, the election happened anyway. But there's my name in Hebrew, Hollander Michael, my address. I mean, it tells me when I'm going to vote in at what polling station. And then I take this piece of paper. Um, there's no need to register, by the way, unlike many other countries. And I'm not saying which one located between Canada and Mexico, but we do not need to register. When you're born, when you move here, you have an ID number a nine-digit ID number, and when you're 18, 16, you get your ID card, and when you're 18, you're able to vote. And so you automatically get a notice in the mail, and you take your ID card or your voter or your or your uh, photo uh, driver's license, and you take this piece of paper, and you go into the voting, voting booth. You then are given an envelope. You go into the, you'll see in the next picture, you go into the booth where there is a, a, uh, uh, a tray of pieces of paper. You pick one for the party, and you then put that in the envelope and then at the end of the day they count the votes in the old-fashioned way this is a picture I took in a voting booth you can see these are the two or three or one letter symbols of the parties it's not the name of the party for example this is machal which is the likud party over here and this is po which is the hebrew word for here but it's for kachol lavan there's no connection between the pay and the hey they just choose that particular letter this is the party led by, I think, Benny Gantz at the time, or Yair Lapid. I can't even remember. Too many elections, too short of a period. As long as the party, one of the parties, gets at least three and a quarter percent of the popular vote, it used to be two and a half, now it's three and a quarter, you then have representative, which means, if you do the math, for you statisticians out there, you need a minimum four seats in the Knesset. Right, three and a quarter is the equivalent of four seats. So there's no party that have one to three seats in the Knesset. Each party that passed that minimum threshold meets the president, the head of state, who then tells them, and they then tell the president who they recommend to try to form a government. Could be myself, or could be another party. Then the president gives the candidate who the president thinks is most likely, most capable of forming a coalition, six weeks, 42 days to do so. He has an option of extending it for another, I think, two or three weeks, 14 or 21 days. If it doesn't work, what happens then? Then the president could give another head of another party an option to try to form a government. And that happened a year ago. Or what happens is the person who was given the chance, as in Netanyahu a year and a half ago, he was given the chance. He couldn't in 42 days. He formed a government. He couldn't in the extension. And then he decided to, to pass legislation dissolving the Knesset. It was his opportunity to do that rather than give it back to the president and say, let somebody else give it a go. But he didn't dissolved it, and then went to elections another time. And then there's the process in that six or eight week period of the person who is tasked by the president of trying to form a coalition government, trying to form a coalition from various disparate and oftentimes in disagreement political parties, okay? So far, so good. Now, there's the booth. Here are elections, some pictures I, I put up on presentations from 2020. And there in the first election um, in April 
of 2019. That's me. That's my wife. She always loves voting. You can see, and our daughter, who's now 20, she's now 27 this month, so whatever old she was back then, voting in the school right underneath our house, voting for the first election in four in about two years' time. And outside the room, there was this list. And here is the list from the Knesset, which tells you all the names of all the parties. What's the list here? About 30 plus parties. There is Emet, which is the Labour Party. There is Mer, it's the left of center party. And in Hebrew and Arabic, you look before you go into the room, just to remind you of the name of, of the, uh, the letters associated with the name of the political party. And then you go into the ballot booth. There is my daughter doing it. She's gotten from over here the envelope. She went back over there, took the piece of paper. She put it in the box. I was doing it. Then my wife, of course, in classic Michelle style, doing it in a very uh, choreographed dance dance system. So that was the first election. You'll see pictures of three other elections, or at least two other elections in the same two, two, two year period. Not a winner take all system, as I mentioned before, right? You have to have at least three and a quarter percent. The highest percentage, to put in context, ever received by any party was Golda Meir after the 1967 six day. Where I mean, you know, what, what could they have done wrong? Well, four years later in 73, they did quite a bit wrong. They received 46.2% of the vote, right? Still, only 56 seats in the Knesset wasn't enough to form a government. And so even small parties, think about it. If you get three and a quarter percent, think of the American independent candidates, Ross Perot. I want to say he got like 15 or 20% of the popular vote. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but well over 10% of the popular vote. If you get 10% of the popular vote in Israel, you are today the third largest party in our parliament, to put it in context. But Ross Perot's vote or, or, or what's his name, Anderson's votes or any other third party, can, any third candidate for president, you're throwing the votes away in many ways because unless they're really, there's a, there's a great chance of them winning, all those voices are going to be lost. You don't have that in the Israeli system. So in the fourth of our elections, uh, the third of our elections in the spring of 20, in the summer of 20, May of 2022, 2020, sorry, we had the following division, uh, right in blue, I don't know why they chose these colors, and left uh, or center left in red. You had a block, 55 seats center left, 58 center right, and one party in the, in the center, although it was more to the right, with seven seats. And neither the leading candidate of the left, Benny Gantz over here, who's today our defense minister, his party got 33 seats. Netanyahu's party, Likud, on the right, got 36 seats. None of them were able to form at least 61 coalition. And so what happened? This guy, Benny Gantz, and his entire 33 seats essentially ran on a platform of saying, just not Netanyahu. But as the clock was ticking and Netanyahu was about to turn the baton back to the president saying, I can't form a government, Benny Gantz said, aha, I'm going to jump ship and I'm going to join Netanyahu's party with my members, 15. I'm going to split from my other two parties that formed this larger group that had 33, right? Kacholavan, blue and white. He went down to 15. Why? Because the 18 other members said, we can't sit with Netanyahu. We ran in a platform saying anything but Netanyahu. And now you're telling us this is Netanyahu. And Gantz said, listen, it's May of 2020. We've got something called Corona going on. We've got a war with Gaza, May 11th, right? Uh, a 10 day long war with Gaza. We need to do this for the national cause. The government lasted until December. The agreement was that Netanyahu was going to serve for two years as prime minister. Gantz would be the alternate or the deputy prime minister and would switch him in two years time. It never got to that because there was a vote of non-confidence over the budget. The Prime Minister did not pass the budget by the end of December, and we had to go to new elections, which took place in the spring of 2022. And here you had them signing in the spring, I think it was June, I want to say June of 2020, they signed an agreement, Netanyahu on the right, as he is politically, Gantz on the left, as he is politically, to have this rotational government. It's not the first time it happened. We had a national emergency government in the 67 war, where uh, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol of the Labour Party brought in Menachem Begin of the Likud on the right-hand side, or Machal at the time. We had in 1984 a four-year agreement between Shimon Peres of the Labour Party and Tzach Shamir of the Likud Party to share because they essentially had a tie, a virtual tie, after the election. And that worked actually for four years' time. So it's not the first time it's happened, and it's not the last time, because we have something like that today. Difference number four. 
no constitution. We've got these 14 basic laws, as I said, as I mentioned before, and about the constitutions. This, these were set to be chapters in the constitution. 1992 law, the human dignity and liberty calls recognized for the first time in law, sees Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But in 2018, another law said, views Israel as a Jewish state exclusively, and so raises questions in terms of the non-Jewish minorities in Israel. Uh, and as I said a few minutes ago, it kind of um, votes on the side of Jewish as the priority of Israel over Israel as democratic, which is a huge internal issue of Israel. I'm not going into the politics of that, but that's just a little background on some of the basic laws. No fixed election date, as I mentioned beforehand. The Knesset uh, is supposed to serve for four years time. But it could be dissolved at any time, depending on an inability of a candidate to form a new government. We've seen that. A vote of non confidence. There were two yesterday in the Knesset, and both of them failed, which is incredible because the coalition now has 60 seats, and there's 60 seats in the opposition. But the opposite, it's not an opposition of, you know, well, you've got, uh, I mean, think of, think of, is it 50 50 in the Senate today, or is it no? It's, it's, there was not that long ago. Yeah, it is 50 50 in the Senate, isn't it? Someone nod their head, thumbs up, thumbs down. It is 50 50. And so, if it's a tie, the vice president, right, in America comes in, Kamala Harris, and she's the one who's supposed to vote this way and that. Ideally, it's not supposed to happen, but that could happen. So, in the Knesset, we've got takeover, we've got a tie as well between government and opposition, except it's not 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats, it's the coalition made up of eight parties. We've got five parties who are in opposition, and they don't agree on a lot of things as well. There's an Arab party, and there's two Orthodox parties, and there's a far-right party, and there's Netanyahu's Likud party. So they aren't necessarily going to agree. So it's a fine dance to make sure that the government can stay in place. The government or the prime minister, as I said, can decide, decide to dissolve the Knesset, or if the government fails to pass the budget by the end of March, they will, um, they will go to elections. Why? the failure of the passing of the budget by December lead to new elections because the law is by March. The elections were in May. Government was formed in June. They passed one of the first laws the government passed in absence of having a budget was to extend the period by which they had to pass the budget till the end of December. Right? They just changed the law because they were not, I mean, it didn't make any sense. The government forms in June. There's no budget. You can't form a, gov a budget finalize the budget three months before you sit in government. Anyway, I've lost some of it. Voting day is a national holiday. Voting booths are open from eight in the morning until 10 at night. We're only in one time zone. It's like in Alaska vote three days after the people in Maine vote, right? It's all the same time. And there's no absentee ballot. There's no question of, well, we're ahead in the exit polls and in the counting, but yet there's another five or 7% of the people who are absentee ballots. They have to wait another couple of days to count. The only delay really significant number of votes that are counted a little bit later are the soldiers because there could be a couple hundred thousand soldiers who are voted not that many prisoners not that many uh, people in the hospital but the soldiers sometimes change the number the final allocation of seats a day or two um, uh, one one seat this way one seat that way as i mentioned before state finances most of the elections um radio and airtime is paid for by taxpayers the formula is complicated i can never figure it out based on the number of seats in the previous Knesset. Oh, but there are 13 parties and the 30 who are running. What about the 17 who aren't in the Knesset? Well, they're given money, but less money. So that's not fair, right? The party that has more seats was given more funding by the state. It's a dilemma, but that's the system. Private donations, I mentioned a few hundred dollars, 2,000 shekels, not even $500 a day per household. No corporate donations. As I mentioned before, no absentee ballots, no early ballots, no late ballots, no hanging Chad ballots, just others in Florida. The only exceptions I mentioned are soldiers, prisoners, patients in hospitals, mercenary, and diplomats who serve overseas. When I was an emissary with the Jewish Agency in London in the 19 and 2001, my wife and I were able to vote in the Israeli embassy for the first time. Not foreign ministry, but Jewish agency representatives were allowed to vote. Very high voter turnout, as I say, um, 70 to 80 percent in our first decades. It's fallen in recent years, but in the March 22, you'll see it's a little bit, it fell about 3% in, in March of 2022, but um, sorry, in 2021, but still over 70%. And it's actually a misleading statistic. It's a high statistic. Why? Because 
it's based on population registry. In other words, a lot of people who weren't in the country that day can't vote. Right? My daughter and, and, and boyfriend were abroad. My son and daughter-in-law were abroad. I mean, they had planned their honeymoon you know, way before the Knesset fell and there were elections. So they were in Australia and New Zealand and they couldn't vote. Um, in the last election, to give you a sense, we had eight voting cards to our house. Now, why eight? Because we're five in the family. My wife and I and our three kids. And we have three other people whose address is here. We have a cousin in Australia who lived in Israel for a number of years. And we have uh, friends of ours whose mailing address is here. They're in England. And so they could show up the day of the election. They can't vote in England. They can't vote in Melbourne. But they could show up, take that piece of paper, take their ID card, and vote. And again, second election, September 2019. Yeah, I voting. It was a warmer day. It wasn't short, you could see. We have never, as I mentioned before, had a uh, one party. We've always had coalitions. I already mentioned this beforehand. Um, the largest party, um, up until the 1990s, the largest party usually would get the left of center labor and right of center Likud. Between them would get about 80 seats. What's happened in recent years is it's changed. The biggest parties, like Netanyahu's, have 30, 35 seats, or Gantz is blue and white, 33 seats. Which means that if you take the two biggest parties previously, they would receive 80, more or less, of 120 seats, two thirds, would go to the two major parties, and a third of the votes would go for a number of smaller parties. It's changed. Now, the two major parties, we now have a situation where the two major parties are um, getting about 40 to 50 seats in between them, which means there are more people voting for the smaller parties than the two big parties. So don't think that Israeli elections are about the leader of the Liberal Party running against the leader of the Likud Party. Not not so anymore. Head of state, head of government, as I mentioned before, prime minister is the head of, the, of his or her party, by the president is tasked to form a government, the president elected by secret ballot every seven years. We had a third election, March of 2020. There's Michelle voting. She manages, I will say I took a better picture of her than she took of me, but one person at a time going into the ballot booth. I hate to disappoint you, but in our fourth elections in March of 20, uh, the fourth elections of whenever it was in May or June, no pictures because I volunteered. I spent eight hours in sitting in that chair right over there, actually, just monitoring. Mike, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Now I'm on, I don't know how to do that. I pressed wrong. Anyway, is our multi-party system more democratic? It's a good question. Look, in your winner-take-all system, those with the largest percentage of vote, oh, here it is, get everything. The electoral college, 100% control. Here, Ross Perot, I was off, 18.9%. I did my research when I put this together. That's huge. 20%. To put it in context, if you got 20% of the seats in the Israeli election, 20 times 120 is about 24 seats. That is huge. There's only one party in parliament that has that many seats, and that is an Netanyahu's Likud party. The second largest party, Ariel Pitts, has fewer seats than that. No represent. In other words, one out of every five voters in 1992 who voted for Ross Perot, their vote went down the tubes. Actually, more than that, right? Because what was left in terms of the other two candidates, whoever was running in 1992, very uh, um, because. You only need three and a quarter percent of people voting who are actually um, who, who vote for your party, who in, to receive representation in the parliament. I really believe that it's a more authentic expression of democracy because it allows lots of different groups, call them tribes in Israel, call them sectors in America, to be representative and have their voices heard. In America, you've got issues in both the major parties, right? In the 2016 elections, you had 15 or 16 candidates running to be the Republican candidate for president. And the one outsider from outside of the party actually won the primaries and won the candidacy and won the presidency. And then you had a Democratic Party that struggled to find a candidate around whom everybody could rally. And you've got now in the 2020 election, a person who was pretty clear, I mean, should have defeated the incumbent president, but struggled to defeat the incumbent president because there's lots of opinion within the Democratic Party. When you have a society of 330 million people, you've only got two forms of expression. You've oftentimes got more liberal um, Republicans and more dovish Republicans than you have hawkish Democrats. And there's no real room for kind of subgroupings. I mean, you have your Tea Party in the far right and the Republican Party, and you have your squad on the far left and, and the Bernie Sanders 
crowd in the far left and the Democratic Party. You've got President Biden trying to you know, move it a little bit more to the center. But ultimately, you've got a massive party that might have 70 or 80 million people voting for that candidate. So maybe it would be better to have multiple parties within each of those you know, left, center left and center right parties. It's a question. I'm not suggesting a revolution here, but it's something to think about. Um, what I think the Israeli model has done is it has brilliantly succeeded in transitioning a group of people for 2,000 years in exile, over 70 countries, from coming from over 70 countries. I'm, I grew up in Canada. My wife grew up in America, right? Most of our friends are English speakers from Australia, England, whatever, and we're used to growing up in democratic traditions. But one out of every five Israelis, for example, moved here from the former Soviet Union. Democracy, and even today, democracy. Sorry, did I say that? Somebody's listening. Anyway, if you know people listening from Moscow, don't tell them. But, you know, is it a democracy? Probably not. And the people from the Middle East coming from totally non democratic traditions into a society that I believe has as problematic or as challenging it is to work as a system, it still has a lot of voices in our parliament, which I think is, is what parliament should be about. What's happened in recent years? Number one, I've talked about the reduction in voter turnout. And again, it's a misleading statistic. Even 71.5% is much higher than the American turnout. Right? I'm, I'm even talking not presidential, let alone you know, for school board in, 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 uh, in Cook County or whatever. But 70% um, of everybody in the population registry. So the people who aren't there aren't voting, but they're still counted as part of that. Keep that in mind of the percentage of potential voters. Um, as I already mentioned before, the two major parties in the last election got less than 50%, which means that when a coalition is formed, they're much more reliant on many more smaller parties. Today, we have a coalition of eight parties, the largest of which has 18 seats, 17 seats. That's it. Right? The prime minister heads a party of six seats. How is that possible? Because the nature of our system. The largest party often makes up less than half of the government, even Netanyahu. In the 12 years that he was prime minister from 2009 until 2021, in that period, for most of the time, his Likud party was about 50% of the entire governing coalition, which meant that any time he could lose one of the smaller parties that helped him form a government, he would have to go to a new election. So he had to dance that very fine dance of making sure that everyone was happy. I'll never forget, he was prime minister in one of the Gaza operations, and his... Uh, Foreign Minister Victor Lieberman, I think, and his Defense Minister Bennett at the time, or vice versa, were both critical of the government policy. Uh, possible to imagine that leading members, so Finance Minister and, and Defense Minister, Finance and Foreign Minister, were critical of the policies of a government while in the midst of an operation in Gaza. You would never have that in American presidential system because they would be given the boot. The Prime Minister couldn't do that because he'd have to go to new elections. People are no longer voting along the traditional lines that divided Israeli society between hawks on the right and doves on the left, which basically resolved, revolved around the question of what to do vis-a-vis -vis the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, Gaza, and the Palestinians. That's not the main issue today. In the last election in particular, um, in the last couple elections, things have changed quite a bit. So we're voting a lot more along tribal identities. I'm an immigrant or a descendant of immigrants from Morocco, and I think my grandparents were given a raw deal in the 50s when they came here and put it into a tent in the middle of the desert. I'm going to vote for Shas. I'm not ultra-Orthodox, but I think this ultra-Orthodox party really gives voice to the Sephardic underclass that has been oppressed by the Ashkenazi elites. I'm going to vote for them. And besides, if I could send my kids to free school, you know, from picked up in the morning from 7.30 in the morning and dropped off at 4 in the afternoon, hot lunch, great. So it, I'll put on a kippah, and so it, they'll go to yeshiva, but I'm willing to do that. So you've got a lot of growth of the smaller sectarian parties. The personalization of politics. Even though you don't vote for a person, it doesn't say you're voting for Netanyahu. It says you're voting for the Likud party. More and more Israelis are voting for a person. And the last three elections, four, I should add, I should change this, are around the question of to Bibi, very Shakespearean, to Bibi or not to Bibi. In other words, should the guy who's under investigation, three cases, four cases of investigation, three on trial as we speak, should he be allowed to run? Uh, yes, great, I'll vote for one of the parties that will support him, not necessarily his. And no, I'll vote for one of the many parties who are opposed to him being in government at all. Um, our last election, excuse me, in uh, two years' time, the fourth, 
March. Here is the list of the parties, just to put it in context, right? Number of massive, massive number of parties. Everyone also gets an option of a white ballot. I'm voting for nobody. It's thrown out and doesn't really count, but why bother? Why bother showing up? But whatever. Here are the major candidates, um, not the parties, right? their faces. As I said, even the, the press is guilty, I think, of personalization, right? BB won the elections. There's BB on the up above. He didn't. His party won more seats than any other party, but nobody voted for Benjamin Netanyahu. They voted for the Likud party led by Benjamin Netanyahu. And each party, I didn't mention this, has its own system for electing its, or, or selecting, I should say, not all elected, selecting its candidates. So, for example, uh, this party over here, Sephardic Alt Orthodox Party, led by Rabbi Ari Ederi, who's at least once been in prison for bribery and corruption and other crimes, but you know, did his time and came back and was allowed back into politics and then became the interior minister. He just resigned actually a year ago because he had some other issues. He was being investigated for other things. Go figure. Anyway, but he and a group of rabbis sit in a room and select a list of men, only men who run for that particular party. Uh, this woman, Merav Micheli, the head of the Labor Party, uh, a journalist, former journalist, actually the granddaughter of Kastner, the one, the Hungarian Jew who negotiated with the Nazis and got people out of Hungary, very famous story, was murdered in Israel. But Merv Macheli was chosen by the tens of thousands of members of the Labour Party in a, in a primary for the leader of the party. Each party has its different method of, of choosing their list. And here you can see there's some where you vote for uh, the party. This is Mayor, it's a left of center party. It just says vote, I'm just saying it's just the name of the party. And then it says here, Emet pe politica, truth in politics, vote for the Labour Party. And there, here it says, is a picture of Rabbi Ovadi Yosef, the former Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel. He's been dead for about 20 years. His funeral was the biggest in, ever in Israeli history, by the way. But um, his idea was to, uh, says, it says, Ein lano al -mi li -shen. we don't have anybody to rely upon except for God, of course. And the rabbis are our interpreters of that. Vote for Shas. He still draws a lot of votes, even though he's been buried for about two decades. Some of the other parties, I just took this picture as I was jogging or bike riding, whatever, um, in the neighborhood, signs put up all over the place. Um, and all throughout the election campaigns for in the past two years, there have been protests outside of the prime minister's residence. If you read the Times of Israel, there's an article about the building here. It's called The Ugliest Building in Jerusalem. That There's a headline today that said that it's finally going to be taken down in a taller, you know where it is, Beth, it's in front of, it used to be the Sheraton on one side, the tall building, and, you know, right opposite where the Jewish agency building is, Beth knows exactly what I'm talking about, down the block. Um, it's going to be taken down. But there are protests in front of the prime minister's house. How can the guy who's under investigation um, and now is in court be allowed to and run as a candidate, and the quote says here in Hebrew, Mushchat, was just before Passover, the corrupt one, what does he say? What are these laws for you, for you, and not for him? So I'll play on the Passover Seder, you know, nothing to do with me, I've got different rules and regulations for me, I'm the Prime Minister, I'm above the law, but ultimately, the Prime Minister's party, um, the Prime Minister, Netanyahu, was not able to form a governing coalition. And a few months ago, my favorite Israeli think tank, the Israel Democracy Institute, came out with a study about social protests, right? Two main protests in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2011 and 2021. Social protests over the high cost of living. Do they maintain their goal? You can see the results. What about the Balfour protest? Even the political right. More than, and to have Israelis vote 50% is pretty high. And 70% of Israelis believe in the major protests, the same time the Arab Spring started in 2011, we had protests that began in Tel Aviv across the country with the high cost of living, and we've had protests for a number of years in front of the Prime Minister's house. Seven out of ten Israelis think that this these protests can influence the government, um, government's policies. The last election voting in, uh, where I said it was, I forget the date, in 2021, in March of 2021. Here are the notes that we got at our house. Five family members, as I mentioned, Two friends from England and my cousin from Australia. Um, I could have sold these to any of you, and I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it. anyway. Soldiers voting, you can see in uniform on their bases. The, the day the voting started at 8 a.m., one of the pictures in one of the papers was a young Israeli soldier casting a ballot um, at a voting station. And the Knesset was empty, of course, for the voting day. There is the Knesset. But shortly after, um, we actually had a government formed. Um, Netanyahu was unable to form a coalition because it was so close and ultimately a new government was formed with the broadest coalition ever 
center left Yair Lapid's party, 17 seats. S center right, I actually say right now, even center party of uh, Naftali Bennett, who is now the prime minister, six seats. And the left of center Ram party of Mansour Abbas, who is constantly in the headlines, formed a coalition agreement signed in June of eight political parties, three left of center, two of the center, and three right of center. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Why? Their unity of purpose was formed between these two guys, right of center Bennett and left of center Lapid. Both of them had been in government before in 2013 with Netanyahu. And between them, they had 31 seats. Lapid party had 18. And Ben and he he started. He was a political neophyte in 2013. He ran in the elections. He got 18 seats. Bennett got 13 seats, and they agreed to sit together with Netanyahu as long as no ultra orthodox would be in the government. And that's exactly what happened until Netanyahu fired his finance minister Lapid at the time over to the budget. We went to new elections, but that too is a story of ancient history of all of eight years ago. Here are the eight political factions, one woman leader, Merab Mecheli, as I said, three of the right, three of the left, and two of the center. Nothing short of miraculous. Look at the results, right? Number of registered voters, 6.6 .6 million, valid votes, 4.4. You needed 36,000 seats to get into Knesset. The largest party, Likud, 30 seats, and it runs all the way down, 13 parties. And what happens? The government is then formed by this party, Asia Tid with 17, with uh, this party, Blue and White, with eight, that's 25. Yamina, Bennett's party with seven, that's actually down to six now. Labor with seven. Um, Israel Beitenu, uh, party on the right. Um, the the uh, New Hope party, the Merits party, United Arab list. So you've got eight parties of 13. And what happened? Notice what's happened in the elections. Netanyahu's party got 30 seats, seven less than the previous election. And Lapid's party got four seats more. Right? Big drops, big changes in the elections, but very high voter turnout, as I said, 67.5%. Still, let's keep in mind that a lot of people are registered, but they don't show up to vote because they're outside of the country on vacation, studying or whatever else. When you come to learn about our parliamentary democracy, you will, of course, come to the Knesset and not just see the plenum, but see the beautiful art, part of the beautiful Chagall tapestries on one side, beautiful mosaic of the Western Wall. When the Knesset was dedicated in 66, we couldn't get into the old city. It was in Jordan, don't forget. The Chagall was commissioned to do a lot of art to decorate the Knesset. We've had, I put this together before last election, 12 prime ministers. Netanyahu ended in 2012. And finally, because he is our current prime minister, I give him his own full picture. There is Naftali Bennett. Since June of 2021, Prime Minister, there is the cabinet um, with Bennett on the left, although he should be on the right, obviously on the right where he's sitting, and Lapid on the right, although he's on the left. He is the alternate Prime Minister for now, as Gantz was under Netanyahu for six months, and in the middle was the then President Reuven Rivlin at the House of the President, and our current President, as just the past few months, is Buji Isaac Herzog, some of you may know as the former. Um, head of the Jewish uh, chairman, or, yeah, chairman of the Jewish agency for Israel. And with that, I see I've got exactly one minute of the hour. I did it within an hour. Hopefully, none of you are nauseous or seasick, or maybe emotionally fatigued or whatever, or intellectually fatigued. But I've given you the almost dozen reasons why our political system is different than your political system. Does it work? Hey, we're still here, we're dealing with lots of nasty neighbors who are committed to our destruction, a couple neighbors we have some fragile peace relationship with, some a little distant neighbors we have peace with. We've had corona here. We've got lots and lots and lots of issues, but we're still here, and not bad, 24 elections in 74 years. Will the current government, I know somebody's going to ask, will the current government last? I have no idea. I didn't think the current government would last a year. It did. It still is here. We have a budget for the first time in three years, which is incredible. I mean, we didn't have a budget. How do you fight Corona when you don't have a state budget until it's passed, you know, in, in less than a year ago? It's crazy. But I mean, there was a budget. The budget was adjusted for inflation based on the last time the budget was passed. But, you know, you've got different needs that change over time, particularly when you've got a pandemic. Anyway, we're still here. It's complicated. It's different. But it's Israel and it's democratic. Thank you so much, Mike, as always. I hopped on a little bit late and I'm, you know, 
again, just incredible. <laughs> Um, and I really appreciate that firsthand viewpoint into the election booth. Uh, really great. I, I, just, I couldn't take a video in there. I just want to show that it really, really happens. And I just thought, I was like taking pictures of, of people voting. And my, my youngest, who's be 24 next week, and he was in the Air Force for four years. So he voted four times. And every time he voted, it was always at his base. He gets the card at home. He could vote at home. It's actually an issue. They have to make sure that if he votes at home, he doesn't vote twice right on his base right so he voted on his base and every time he voted my eldest son voted twice too one uh i think you know once when he was in the army and i said take a picture now he can't really take pictures they're not supposed to take pictures themselves anyway and they on their base every time they're on a base they put a little sticker over their camera so they couldn't take pictures while they were on their base so they wouldn't have been able to anyway but yeah we said oh it'd be a good idea they were out in the field but yeah we forgot so you see them online soldiers voted and how do they vote so ask my, my eldest son years ago, who's now 29, when he voted, I said, so there are elections, are you guys voting? Yeah, you know, what do you, you guys talk about it? A little bit. So how do you vote? He said, all over the place. My eldest was in a, a special forces unit connected with the paratroop brigade in Maglan, and they, um, small team of like 20 guys. And he said, yeah, you got far left of center guys. Um, um, There's one guy in his team whose father was the Yair Golan, who's a far left of, of center member of Knesset, and then far right ultra nationalist Jews who live in Judea, Samaria, the West Banks. So they're kind of all over the place, but they all vote. Um, and my eldest, my youngest son, probably less diverse. And they're and it's amazing. You depending on the unit, and you you can't you can I I can tell in my city, you know, hundred thousand people, and they'll publish how many people voted, how many voted for this party. But and you can tell from different polling stations, right, who votes what. So I can tell you that where I live, and a neighborhood a mile over there is more religious, and they're more likely to vote for religious parties. And where I live, and another area, Maccabim and Rood, is much more uh, left of center. So they're definitely labor and merits. And but in the army, you can't. They don't say. They just say the number of soldiers votes. They don't say which base votes in this in this way and that way. But you know, in certain units, that they're more likely to vote this way than that way. So. Fascinating. Well, we thank you. We look forward to uh, part two of this class uh, and its conclusion next week. Uh, so, waiting on the wall, Tel Aviv. Thanks, everybody.